<laughs> Fucking fuck him for a halter neck. <laughs> you know. My name's Sorley MacDonald. I am an artist originally from the Highlands, but exiled to Glasgow since 1998. I do everything from photography to painting to landscape photography. People always used to get confused by what I did. And I was used to just say like, basically I make pictures, which is basically what I do. I make sound too, but I don't make any money. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I listen to the music, at first, it's a lot to take in. And I, I like music like that. Music that can evoke like a different time or place, I suppose. It took me a while to to figure out what was going on, you know, because like there's like time time changes and fucking there's heavy bits and a song. It gave me visions of heavy weather and uh, I suppose with my landscape photography and stuff like that, I spend a lot of time looking for places and things that are like, well, it's a bit art wanky to say that, but that sort of like transcend human stuff. And obviously the whole theme of it is the like the Lewisian uh, rocks and everything. And of course, uh, uh, I used to spend a lot of time in Loch Inver and I fucking love it there. And you know, like some of the rock there is 2.6 billion years old which is fucking mind-boggling. Like, the moon's only, what, 3.8 billion years old? You know, it's like, you can stand on that rock. Like, I've always been obsessed with Sylvan, you know, because a lot of people see Sylvan as, like, this sort of um, majestic kind of thing, you know. But I don't see him that way. To me, he seems disgruntled and he's had enough because he's been standing there for so long. So he was an Inselberg. They're all Inselbergs up there. So they were like rocks that stuck out the glaciers. And so they've had two, maybe three glaciers around them, which is mad. And they were in a completely, you know, they were in a completely different, like the continents were completely different when that rock was formed. It took me a little while to think what to do, but <clears throat> as with most things, I just fucking wing it and then things just direct you and you find things because if you've got like something in your head you can search for it and the world will provide something. It might not be the thing, you, it's very rarely the thing you expect but it's always like, it's always there if you're looking for it you can always find it. You maybe not find it first time or second time but if you go back and I was dead keen to go to Harris because of the old um, human history there. Because that's uh, Norton in Harris is one of the longest, const constantly inhabited places where humans have been. So there's still people there that are native to the place, and they've been there since the last ice age. So. Um, I thought that was quite compelling for the grand scheme of things. And I had my eye on those beehive cleats because um, I had made an attempt to get up before, but I didn't have enough time. So I just sort of sprackled up the hill for a while and then had to retreat. But they're in a place called Sron Smirisol. The nose, I don't know what Smirisol means, but a nose, it's like, so it's the end of a, end of a hill um, you know, it's, it looks like a nose. And then they're nestled in this wee area that is sheltered on like three sides, two and, a, two and a half sides. There's like a big rock next to where they built them, which is like the perfect couch. And it's like, you're like, I could see why you'd build something here. Because there's a perfect seat that you could get maybe six or seven people on. And then the water runs off runs off the uh, the Sron, the rock face at the side. And you can see where they've worked, where it, because 
I'm not sure how, nobody's really sure how long they've been in use. But, you know, some estimates are sort of eight to 10,000 years. And there's only really one of them still standing with its roof and everything, but there's loads of them everywhere. I think there's about eight in, in seven or eight in total in that area. But you can see where they've worked the ground to collect fresh water and all this sort of stuff. And every time I find a death metal uh, waterfall, I get the song, you know, like From the Mountains by the Massacre Cave from Egg. Yeah. Yeah. And it just comes on. Of like death metal waterfall, you know. So a very Gallic thing to me. Like, with all, what I love about what you've done with this thing is, you know, the poems written by Herring, Ewan Henderson, yeah, and Deirdre sings it. And what I love, I've always loved putting Gallic stuff in its right place. If you think about living in Assent or uh, Harris when there's ice retreating from there. Like, nothing's easy about that. Nothing's roaming in the gloaming. Like, it's dangerous and hard. And sure, like, the world is always very beneficial, but not all the time. We live half, half the year in darkness, especially up that way. And the weather's terrible. I suppose my disposition is towards the darker side of things. Yeah, I went uh, to get the boat. I was I was working for Fraser Ross, and I went up the road, and I went I went to the Destitution Road, which is like this brutal road that got built all the way from Dundano, from uh, Corrie Shalloch. And terrible story uh, about that road, but I'll not go into that. And I went up there, and the weather was just absolutely hooring it in, like like, and uh, there was just these snowstorms, just piling in and so I'd set myself up with, with the car as a shelter and time lapse it and then I'd have to stand in the right place so the camera didn't shake too much. The camera would inevitably shake and you know like the common parlance is to fucking smooth it out but I was like fuck that it's like it's windy how do you know it's windy things fucking shake don't they why, why would I smooth it out it's a stupid thing to do that's a very human thing to do but yeah, it was a fucking amazing weather. And then I did, did, the, did the gig with Fisher Ross. And then the next day, <clears throat> I went up to Inver Polly. And there had been these boulders that I'd seen. And I had been to look for them once before. Uh, but I didn't have the time to get to them. So anyway, with all this snow coming in, I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to that boulder. Uh, I want to make friends with this boulder. And uh, that's the boulder at the end that looks sad. And no fucking wonder, because he's been stuck there for millions of years, dropped there, dropped there by a glacier, you know. And uh, I love all these boulders around Assen because as the glacier went away, the bigger ones come down slowly on the ice, and then they'll just precariously balance on small, little small rocks, and they've just sat like that for tens of thousands of years. And you're just like, that's cool. Like to me, that's just cool. Anyway, I went up there and. It was a squally day, so you'd have moments where it was like, like it was cold the whole time, but you'd have moments where like the, uh, the weather was nice, you'd have blue sky. And when I was standing up on that bit, uh, it's called Drum, Drum Badagal. And you can, see the, you can see the weather coming across the sea, the minch. And it'll just come in and you're like, oh, it's going to hit me soon, it's going to hit me soon. But I got some fucking amazing footage of just the mountains just getting disappeared into this cloud and it's funny because for years I've been I mean the video is quite strong at capturing it but you know like a lot of my paintings have that kind of vibe to it as well where I'm like trying to trying to like capture like try to make you think what's it like to be a fucking mountain I suppose since I was a kid I've always thought this way it's like what's it like to be a tree you know because they're really slow as well and they all help each other out and everything. But to, to think about being a boulder is just like, it's a really odd thing to think, you know? But anyway, I'd be standing up there and you would just see this, you know, a big cobalt grey mass out at sea. It would come in and you just, you're time-lapsing the camera, so 
you know, once the weather gets bad, there's no way it's staying up. It doesn't matter where you stand, what you're doing, the camera is going down into the fucking snow and the bog. So <clears throat> you just, I would just have to stand there for as long as I could possibly muster with the camera fucking shaking and, and I'm like, oh, it's shaking. Of course, I, now I don't care about camera shaking because I, I realize it makes it look real. And I, I just stand there and then the weather just hit and the snow just absolutely just, it's just so cold when it's moving at 60 miles an hour, snow and hail. You know, you have to cover your face because it's like, otherwise it feels like someone's fucking just going at your face and with ice, you know what I mean? But that was an amazing day. I've never had a day that was that epic like so close to the car. I walked back in the dark. I was absolutely freezing and my camera was fucked. The buttons on the back were no longer working because the snow had got comp compressed into the gaskets and all that. So amazingly, I could still use the touch screen on it to make it do stuff. And the shutter button still worked. But other than that, all the buttons on the back were dead and I was like, oh no, have I killed my camera again? But thankfully, uh, the Dacia Duster's got a great fan heater. So just sat it on the fan heater, and next day it was working again. So, but that was it. It's like trying to keep rain and snow off lenses is just like that is ninety percent of being like a landscape photographer. Obviously, the te the other ten percent is buying having enough money to buy the ridiculously expensive gear and then knowing where to go with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but other than that, 90% of it is like mitigating bad weather. All right, well, I mean, this is the thing with the time lapses. You're looking at something there that's running over a couple of seconds. But I stood there for an hour and a half to get that. But you've got no idea what it's going to look like because you're, you're living in real time or human time. You're not living in the time of the boulder, that's for sure. Because it's living in a much longer time. And then, and then you're putting it onto a video, which is going to be looked at on a computer, probably. And then it's all fast. You're time traveling, like play with time. And like it's a cool, like it's a cool thing to do because it makes it makes you, it gives you the ability to think in all time scales. It's like a conduit. And that worked well for the, for, you know, for the concept of what you had. Because when I when I was out uh, going up the beehive cleats, the rain was so thick. I can only describe it as thick. It wasn't like heavy rain. It's like a really thick smear. So it's like really fine rain, and it just collected on you, and then it would rain on you. It wasn't like. It was falling from the sky. It was just wetness everywhere. You know, like a wall of wetness that you were sort of pushing through. It was everything else that started raining. It's the weather, the, the, the water would just collect on you. And it was like, the camera just got so soaked. And there's just, after a while, there's, there's no way you can get the water off the front of it. So you just have to put up with it. You know what I mean? And it was actually the, it wasn't until I got to the cleats that I was able to clean my lens because there was a fucking shelter there. <laughs> so it's sitting inside this old beehive cleat, sitting in the muddy puddle at the bottom of it, you know, like getting the alcohol out and try to clean the try to clean the the water off the lens, you know. And then you go out and it just get wet again. So it's like you just had to just had to accept that it was going to get wet and. But that lens like died twice on that expedition. But it just kept coming back to life and it works still. It doesn't work that great, but it works. I mean, that's another thing about Harris, it's amazing. There's bits where, there's bits where there's like groundworks and lazy beds and all that, you know, that go back thousands and thousands of years. And you see, there's, there's this one little corner uh, on the Avid Suya Road where there's like, there's three council houses there right but then you can see all the old like the old township there there was never many people there i wouldn't say <clears throat> and then you can see and it's like you can 
you can look at the council houses and then go down to the shore and it's like a travel traveling through like 5,000 years just looking from the houses to the shore because you see all the things people have done to the ground you know what I mean I mean even even that house that's in in the sort of section after the song like that house it was such a strange experience finding that house because I I'd, I'd been driving around Harris and every derelict I went to you know if I, if I could get in without disturbing it I would go and have a look inside and stuff. But that one particular house, it was like, it was just amazing. You could feel the people who had lived there and you knew they were native to that place. And fuck knows why they had to leave, you know? And like, I've totally got it in my head now that I have to go back and find that out because the house at the end of the road from there, they're definitely from there because there's a pile of Ford Orions and escorts <laughs> that run back to the mid 80s. So they're definitely local. So I need to go back and speak to them. But that, that place was mad because I went in and you just had this, you could just feel the souls that had, that had lived there. And, you know, like I've always had a problem with like uh, taking stuff from these places. But with that place, Every time I went in, it was dangerous because the roof would come in one place and there was, you know, like loads of big old square nails. So walking around in your Dunlops is like dangerous. So you have to watch what you're doing. And it was quite a windy day at points. So, you know, the roof could have shifted for sure because it was just a tin roof. And, the, you know, like the timbers are just like dust. And <coughs> I went in, but it was just so strange. Everything was still laid out the... Like, there was a bag on the bed that had been put just right at the end of the bed, you know, perfectly placed. And it had a, like, a vanity mirror in it and a silk scarf. And then uh, on either side of the bed, they had the bed was made still, tucked in tight, and the, even though the roof had fallen in on it, so obviously it was filthy. And then there was two pairs of shoes 90 degrees to the bed, Sunday best shoes, you know, like a grey leather patent shoe. And there were still cosmetics on the on the stand at the side. And then in the living room, they had the two chairs were still there. And on the table, there was a Bible. And it was weird. So I went into that house and I didn't, I didn't even turned the camera on when I went in. I'd been filming outside and stuff like that. And I was, I was just like, I was so, I was, I don't know. It's just like, uh, you feel the ghosts, you know what I mean? And anyway, it kept beckoning me back in. So I went in and then I, I, I was like, okay, this place is cool. Like I like, it felt that the stuff that was in it and the feeling it gave me was that it was welcoming. Like, they wanted me to stay. Anyway, I got in the car afterwards, and I was driving back to the, to the west side of Harris, and I got this fucking weird feeling in my right foot. I was convinced I'd fucking stepped on a nail. I was driving along, and I was like, I kept getting this pain in my foot. So I stopped in a lay-by, and I took my boot off, and I checked my sock, and it was fine. And I was like, okay, no bother, I'm fine. It's just all in your head. I got back in the car, kept driving, and then I felt this wetness coming from the bottom of my foot. And I was absolutely 100% sure I fucking stood on a nail and that was the blood pouring out of my foot. And so I stopped in another lay-by, took everything off, fucking, and I was looking at my foot and it still felt, felt wet. And it was not wet. And I was just like, what what does this mean? You know what I mean? I couldn't I couldn't like uh, I couldn't tell whether they wanted me to go back or because the thing about that house was it had been there it it was probably there I don't know how old it could have been but it was the old style so it was piled up rocks it was a black house you know it had a tin roof on it but it was a black house so it had definitely been there you know since since before Culloden but. Somebody, uh, somebody could have been living there for thousands of years. Anyway, I went, I went back home afterwards. And I was speaking to my dad about this sort of thing because, you know, he's, he's from the sort of old Highland world. He was telling me 
about my granny, well, my great granny came up here. And it's quite a, it seems like it's quite a common thing in the Highlands. Um, now, nobody would ever say it's to do with sort of pagan beliefs or whatever, but um, what my dad was suggesting to me was that it's, there's a, a thing about thresholds where, you know, if you have to move away from your old life, then you should leave your old life behind for the spirits and for everybody else to see. So you leave it in good order. You don't take the stuff with you. And this is the, this is the thing about Highland culture, was that the idea of ownership is not really a thing until recent history. Um, and the nobility and all that, I suppose. But the idea would be to survive. It wasn't to own things. And if you own things, well, they're, they're a plus to your survival. You don't need them. You know what I mean? Yeah. What you need is your family and, your, and the world around you. So I thought that was quite poignant. Like, it's a funny thing because I have this, you know, if you like go to the beehive cleats, like they're just rocks piled up. And sure, people didn't live there like day in, day out. That was like summer pasture or whatever. You know, maybe people would hide there, but nobody lived there. But perfectly functional shelter, and you've just piled rocks up. And it's like, that's how simple life is. You can just pile rocks up and make a house. So, and I quite like the idea of that, just leaving your stuff behind for the world to take it. And you just move into your new life and you start accumulating more stuff, you know. I mean, this is a theme that sort of runs through a lot of my work, I would say, because the the human world just drives me mad with its, like, stuff and things. And you're like, but what are the, you know, they're not, stuff and things, like, are great, sure. <clears throat> but they don't make, they don't make a life. A life's made by simple, very simple things, like playing with fucking kids and animals or, reading books or painting or going for a swim in the fucking sea. These are the things that are, like, important and not, not the stuff. And I love that about, about the sort of old Highland culture is that it's definitely not like that now, but it used to be. And I think that's a very important facet of it, you know, like the to remain indigenous, you know. It was like with the Romans, like, they're always... You know, like everyone talks about being Celtic. And all that was was the Romans giving a catch-all term to people who didn't want to be civilised because they preferred to live life as natural indigenous people because that is what life is. Because when you get involved in this people world, life gets so complicated. And the natural world's complicated enough. The fact that rocks can be 2.6 billion years old, you know, but then, if you don't know that, they're just fucking rocks. Basically, I went up, and I was I had to get to, back to the ferry. And I thought, if I go to Callanish, I'm going to spend hours moving things out of the way, like placards, fences. But the reason I went to that one was because there was two derelict houses right next to it. And so, like, the shot through the window that comes down, that, that house is right next to the, to the stones. Oh, the bus, I, it was Doogie Cunningham, actually, another landscape photographer who turned me onto that bus. Well, his girlfriend, Amy, actually. Apparently it's an old scout hut. So it's just like local bus, you know, something went bad on it. So they donated it to the scouts and left it at the beach there. So it's got a toilet where the driver used to sit and a sink, but I mean, it's pretty beyond. It's still, like, the windows are still good, so you could sleep in it, no bother. It's pretty dirty, though. It was pretty foreboding in that light. By the time I got there, I was absolutely fucked. Like, I think I'd been out since maybe seven in the morning, and I'd been all over the place and like yomping across bogs in derelict houses thinking my foot's bleeding, all these different things. 
and the weather was just so inclement. I went to the salt flats at Norton because it's a pretty classic like landscape uh, photography place. And actually, I quite enjoyed my time down there because uh, the reeds that are dancing. That I found that there, and I got totally hypnotised by those reeds. Just, I stood there for maybe 40 minutes because I was trying to get Capaval, which is the big hill, and that's uh, that's the centre of Old Harris. So that's where all the really old shit was, is on around Capaval, and. I'm not. I'm not sure of the ins and outs of it, but I do believe it's got. It's got quite a lot of spiritual meaning. Um, what that is, I don't know, because th obviously with the things about the Western Isles, is all these old beliefs have been muddied with the Christian beliefs. So I suppose there's a symbiosis between them, but it's all tied up in the, that very pious Presbyterian thing. And yeah, I don't get it. Anyway, but the thing is, those salt flats, those reeds, have probably been there for a thousand years. But each individual reed is only a year old. So that's quite, that's quite mental when you think about it. And also the death metal birch trees were there. So they were good. So I got the massacre cave in my head for that one too. And uh, yeah, I spent a while time-lapsing birch trees, which is like a fucking strange thing to do. An important cross, the dog. But the dog was a good idea because we came up with the dog early on, didn't we? Because when I heard Ben's solo, I was like, what do you do for this? Like, it is a fucking incredible piece of guitar playing. I was like, what the fuck? Like, what do you do to this? Like, that man is crazy. He's like, he's like all time. Like, he is like top level fucking jazzer. Like, incredible piece of guitar player. I was just like, what the fuck are we going to do about this? And that was it. And it was the wolves. I saw wolves. But yeah, Shadow did very good. Scary dog, though. Because he could take your fucking hand off. Man, you'd have to fight. Be like that scene out of uh, The Revenant. You ever seen that with a bear? Be like that. It's always that in every animal. Humans, too. This is the thing. We forget these facets of life. And they're there for a reason, because as benevolent as the world can be, it can also be evil and tormenting. And if you don't look at both sides, you're not seeing the world. You know what I mean? So you have to have both sides. You have to have big, heavy, distorted basses. You have to have angular guitar solos that like melt your face off. And you have to have nice Gaelic songs, which then get heavy as fuck. You know what I mean? I love the heavy weather. I mean, that morning, especially when, you know, like, I've been, I've been sort of trapped in the city again for a few weeks. And the weather's, like, my car's me fucked, so I've been riding my bike, so I've been experiencing the weather a bit. I do find places in the city which are, like, that do have a, a certain something about them, but these old places, they make, they make me feel at home. Like, especially in Assen. I just fit right into it. I'm, like, the right height for it. Short, so I'm out of the wind. I'm like, I understand the bogs there. I don't know. There's just something about it that has, like... Um, and I suppose, you know, my family are not from Assen, but they're from Western Ross. So it's similar, you know. But, I mean, that's the thing. I, I don't understand how, how my grandpa McDonald survived out in Torridon back in the day, you know. I don't think he even had shoes until later on in life. And it, it just boggles my mind. Because I'm out there with fucking, well, I mean, I only wear Dunlop gumboots because they are the best footwear in the Highlands, bar none. But in the snow, you need, the, you need walking boots in the snow because of the cold. You know, I'm standing out there in these, you know, Gore-Tex this, puffer jacket that, and I'm still freezing. It's terrible. You know, there's moments we think, is the sky going to fall on my head? Like, because the weather gets so violent that you think, I might die. And I fucking love that. Because it's, it's like, uh, it makes you feel like you, you, you're alive then. You know you're alive. Because you could be dead. 
and like the violence of the world it's like there's something like there's still a benevolence to it because it wipes your mind of like human nonsense you don't think about politics or money or property when you're in a force five snowstorm you don't you know you think fuck me i'm cold and i hope this stops it <laughs> you know what i mean and it was like when i was up on the ridge at acid like when when these squalls came in sometimes they'd go up go away past me here in front of me and i'd just be standing there going yes yes because i i would have got a whole i would have got a whole squall you know and it would take take Sulban in and then Canis disappear and then Coolmore disappear and then Stack Polly disappear and then Coyoch disappears and I'm just standing there and it's missed me completely you know what I mean and I'm like yes fucking got one from beginning to end you know what I mean and then other times it was just like <laughs> and you're like I would try and run the camera for as long as I could because some of the footage that I got like was right in the middle of this of the squalls, you know. And then I would run it for as long as I could, and then once it got violent enough, I would just fucking run for the nearest boulder. You just get in the lee of the boulder and you just you just get in there. You just get in the lee of the boulder. And see that just that one thing, you're like, you're safe. You know what I mean? Just get in there behind this boulder. And I mean, like life doesn't get simpler than that, does it? You're like you know, it's not like getting a mortgage. It's completely different. It's hiding behind a boulder. <laughs> so, and that's the thing. It's hard to get anyone to listen to a 10 minute piece of music. And I'm not sure if the video will make it any easier. <laughs> but, you know. It was worth a try. <laughs>